Dendi is an aspiring engineer, jack-of-all-trades scientist, coder, and IT support rolled into one. When she is introduced, she comes across as a socially awkward child prodigy that observes and interacts with the world at large as a giant case study. She's quiet, hides or sneaks up on subjects, and only interferes or makes herself known if she wants to reposition a scene or make a proposition. Dendi sees herself as a neutral scientist in just about every aspect of her life. When she reaches out to K.O., it's her first real interaction with someone else her own age that treats her like just another kid instead of a beyond-her-years anomaly. Looking at how Dendi behaves and conducts herself gives the impression that she's more used to trying to talk to adults or treated as older and more mature than she is because of how smart she is, her expansive vocabulary, and some of her more stilted, hard-to-read mannerisms. K.O. brings out her more childish side. They play tag, and they talk about their mutual interest in trading cards. When Dendi plays off of K.O. or asks him for help, he meets her at her level. When Dendi plays off of other characters, they're more likely to meet her at her expertise or profession than otherwise. They might be surprised by her age, but Dendi carries herself with confidence and self-assurance beyond her years. It's easy to take for granted. Only K.O. and Miss Quantum meet Dendi at the intersection between her true self and the tech guru. They respect her intelligence, but are still able to appeal to and help Dendi fill in cracks or blind spots she has otherwise. K.O. calls out her lack of consideration or sympathy for others when she comes across as a little too blunt. Miss Quantum doesn't assume that Dendi has full authority on a topic just because she has a wide breadth of knowledge. She always pushes students to further challenge themselves, including Dendi. In a nutshell, Dendi is a fantastic take on someone that is on the autistic spectrum. This is treated as just part of her character, something that contributes to how capable she is, but also poses a challenge in how she understands other people and how they understand her. Most characters eventually see her as her own brand of charming and likable, if just a little bit odd or unsettling. As she becomes more comfortable with herself and friendly with others, it's shown that more characters know her by name and greet her warmly. Dendi wants to empathize with and help others, but she's trying to learn how to navigate the more subtle and nuanced parts and pieces behind social cues. It's a language she doesn't quite understand, but this is presented as something she can learn rather than something that's outright condemned or an absolutely insurmountable obstacle. Placing her as a point of view character every so often helps frame what her worldview looks like or her need for checklists and structures. This is treated as a tongue-in-cheek joke and framing device for OK Dendi, let's be KO. Dendi toes an odd line between subtle nods or knowledge bordering on fourth wall meta, but not enough to interact directly with the audience in a Yakko Warner way. This element is further leaned into with the sitcom cue children cheering sound effect that announces her on-screen arrival. In story, this is set more as her being dangerously detail-oriented and note-taking to the point of an encyclopedic knowledge about the world or characters around her, whether she has her portable database or not. In contrast, K.O. is a walking, talking set of trivia night pointers and fun facts. He knows something in a pinch, but Dendi could write a full PhD student thesis. They're a really interesting compliment. K.O. is ready to become the hero he geeks out about, where Dendi entertains the idea, but isn't quite sure where or how she fits into the picture. When Dendi steps into K.O.'s world for an episode, it's a safe and approachable trial run as a hero versus the identity Dendi would have to handcraft for herself otherwise. Dendi has spent most of her life on the outside looking in. Her research was a means to speculate about the life she wanted. She gets to interact with her interests in an immersive, albeit vicarious way, without directly dealing with the disappointing and restrictive reality. Dendi felt like heroics was inaccessible to her through a mix of her own social awkwardness, as well as the social stigma, prejudice, and discrimination against Kappas. PAL cards are set as a socially accepted shorthand for who is a hero, what their accomplishments are, and how powerful they are. Heroes do exist and operate without these cards, but the cards are such a ubiquitous presence in everyday life that a hero's credibility is challenged or placed under higher scrutiny without one. By barring Kappas from receiving one, period, it's a deliberate move to try and erase them, to keep them invisible, and perpetuate harmful stereotypes. Challenging and convincing the PAL card company to reconsider giving Kappas their own cards was a significant step both as part of pushing back against wider societal issues and building Dendi's confidence. That said, any heroic feats or adventures Dendi embarks on would be part of setting a precedent. 
She's very much living through important historical times, and may feel intimidated by what her legacy or contributions to that could be. K.O. has already proven himself. Even if he isn't as established as his co-workers, Rad and Enid, or a living legend like his boss, Mr. Gar, he has become a recognized and trusted name in his own right. He has a template for what a day in the life of a hero looks like. By posing as K.O. for a day, Dendi steps slightly out of her comfort zone, but not to the degree that is too extreme or overreaching. She does get a feel for what K.O.'s day and routine are like, while also getting a hands-on feel for what a hero's responsibilities and task load looks like. She isn't K.O. She isn't K.O.'s sidekick, and while she calls herself a substitute or fill-in, she's another teammate alongside Rat or Enid. She becomes logistical support in the same vein as the Oracle in some Batman series. She gives a bird's-eye view of the battlefield, suggests routes that there's rough or rocky terrain, lays out what abilities or threats immediate enemies might be, etc. She has adapted her tech skills and extensive knowledge to something very practical and immediately applicable for heroes doing active field work and taking on missions and environments very different from the plaza or everyday surroundings. Having Dendi as a Jarvis earpiece figure gives a heads up that'd be precious extra minutes of recon or needless scrabbling around in the dark. By the end of the series, it could be argued that she's a battle partner on par or equivalent to what Carol and Mr. Gar were, Silver Spark and Elbow. Rad and Enid are an immediate dynamic duo that are more likely to be paired off or work together if the Mr. Gar team splits up. Dendi fills that particular role next to K.O. Her compliment to K.O. is unique and as the first two-person team in series that highlights how her supplementary equipment and tech could be incorporated in direct fight as much as behind the scenes. This may be a stretch, but support characters like medics or healers in shonen anime often get bashed or needlessly critiqued. Support characters tend to be overlooked or downplayed if they don't receive as much narrative focus as the hard-hitter leads that take up more screen time in big, flashy battles. It's even worse when what few fights a support character gets might show that they have impressive battle skills and abilities, but they pale in comparison to the overpowered main character. It's easy to forget that everybody pales in comparison to the OP lead, but the support character is scrutinized more harshly because of her adjacent role in slight extra screen time compared to the rest of the cast. Spotlighting Dendi for an episode may be an elbow bump that is important, or at least worth considering, to pull viewers into the support character's story every so often. Dendi feels insecure about how overlooked her role is by her classmates, it's not punching and kicking with an immediately satisfying visual element, so it's not as important, right? While she does prove herself by their fickle metric, the core of the episode is K.O.'s unwavering faith and support in her abilities. Their friendship and support for each other is very mutual and symbiotic. She isn't just a piece in his story, he's a piece in hers, too. Placing emphasis on the character relationship helps reinforce why this character is an important player to the narrative, regardless of their technical skill and lack of big, flashy fights. Besides heroes, Dendi's other chief interests are coding and science. In regards to science, Dendi doesn't have a specific field she focuses on or gravitates towards. She has an ambiguous jack-of-all-trades approach to science, as well as an aptitude for inventing and mechanical knowledge like most cartoon scientists from the classic Dexter's Lab to Jack Spicer from Shaolin Showdown. She does focus more on tech, but her pack also allows her to manipulate and play with real-world objects in a fashion similar to a character like Dexter building the exact needed equipment in the blink of an eye. In a way, Dendi turned a classic cartoon staple into a very helpful, more specific piece of equipment in her own arsenal. It's also interesting to plug a character like Dendi next to other characters like Boxman or Venomous. Boxman is very specifically a robot manufacturer, and someone that can build weird, over-the-top inventions. Venomous is specifically interested in biology and ecology. He focuses on Dr. Frankenstein fare from engineering viruses to making monsters. While there are some exceptions to this, neither Boxman or Venomous are the classic broad-strokes mad scientist who has plot-convenient expertise to the degree he makes Frankenstein's monster in one episode and turns around to build a time machine the next. Either of these setups would be a joint venture between Boxman and Venomous. In comparison, Dendi is primed to be that broad strokes approach mad scientist. She'd more likely team up with Boxman and Venomous or Dr. Grayman to build something outside of her scope, but it wouldn't be out of character to see her build something like a time machine by her lonesome. The unique framing in her case is that she'd be pulling from others' blueprints or some reference to a bigger body of research elsewhere instead of just, she intuitively knew how to do just this. 
While Dindy's most important piece of equipment is her hack pack, she has her own equivalent to the aforementioned Dexter with a huge lab space filled with miscellaneous inventions and other equipment. How much of a role her presence this lab plays beyond the Dexter's lab homage is a little dubious. Dindy is shown playing with her pack or running experiments, but she places stronger emphasis on field research or exploring the outside world versus the way her complement Dexter stays cooped up in his lab outside of special exceptions or circumstances. Mystery Science Fair 21X is both a fun, awkward love letter to Dexter's lab, as well as an exploration on some of the fuzzier edges of Dendi's ethics and morals. The episode opens with Dendi not so subtly trying to prod KO for more details about Shadowy Figure and TKO, despite how visibly uncomfortable he is about both topics. She insists that studying turbonic energy is a cutting-edge scientific breakthrough. No one has seen or studied this form of energy before. Rather than pulling from existing research or previous studies, Dendi has a once-in-a-lifetime window of being the first one to research a unique phenomenon. Her curiosity has already been piqued in a way that she's bordering on fixation. Her antagonistic relationship with her teacher Miss Quantum pushes Dendi from light but annoying boundary pushing to completely breaking what boundaries K.O. has set or tried to establish with her. Miss Quantum aggravates and pushes Dendi in a way no one else can. Most of her peers are intimidated or weirded out by her. Most people are impressed or even starstruck by her feats. Considering how much of Dendi's life feels like a never-ending parade of having to prove herself in one way or another, Ms. Quantum is the most blatant challenge to this insecurity. She touts herself as not easy to impress. She is the final boss. Impressing Ms. Quantum is Dendi's measuring stick for personal success, for better or worse. K.O. becomes Dendi's guinea pig as his needs and comfort take a back seat to Dendi's need to prove herself and ultimately satisfy her scientific curiosity. When Shadowy Figure and later Shadowy Venomous try to draw out TKO, he's fully aware and intentional about using KO as a tool for his own selfish goals and ambitions. He plays on KO's emotions and vulnerability to eke out as much power as possible, regardless of how painful and traumatic the process is. Dendi's approach starts out as an earnest attempt to help KO with a very obvious problem. She's a problem solver. In a way, Dendi is trying to tackle TKO in a similar fashion to how Lyos tries to help Senshi work through a very traumatic event from his past in the anime Delicious in Dungeon. Lyos' process is followed from the perspective of his neurotypical party members. He comes across as insensitive and tactless, but what he's doing is very much a wait and trust the process kind of thing. A lot of Lyos' character writing is a masterclass in showing differences between a neurodivergent person and his closer to neurotypical party members in a way that both humanizes him and lays out his odd tendencies in a sympathetic, understandable light. He doesn't understand the lighter and empathetic touch someone else would take with Senshi. It looks like he's trying to brute force and massage a solution through a combination of his extensive knowledge on monsters and heavy-handed detective work. Again, this plays out in a weight and trust respect. Lyos wasn't being ill-intentioned. He could workshop his approach, but this was someone trying to help a friend in the best way he could figure out how. As for Dendi, she becomes so fixed on the goalpost of what results or accolades a successful experiment could lead to, she forgets the original goal. She's willing to use some mental gymnastics to place distance between herself and K.O. by positioning him as just a test subject. She even tries to dampen his lab rat allegations by insisting he's a guinea pig. A guinea pig receives slightly more humane treatment than a lab rat would. From an overarching narrative perspective, Dendi is frighteningly close to the absolute disregard for K.O.'s mental state and emotions Shadowy has. But the guinea pig comment is a signal that Dendi hasn't reached the extreme amount of disassociating and dehumanizing Shadowy regularly engages with to push aside whatever stick-thin ethics he still has or guilt he feels. TKO can and does appeal to Dendi's humanity. It's extreme, but Dendi overstepped K.O.'s personal boundaries in a way he isn't used to, and hasn't fully learned how to push back against or properly shut down yet. TKO's reactions and behavior are warranted here. When K.O. comments on having more control, this is one of the first instances where his concerns fully align with how frustrated and angry TKO is. He needs the assertive, aggressive edge that TKO approaches everyone with, regardless of personal feelings, to fully stand up for himself. Framing Dendi as overstepping but able to learn or rein in her impulses is significantly different than Lyos. 
But she's presented as making a mistake in correcting her behavior, instead of someone that's irredeemable or completely corrupt. Dendi has a near insatiable curiosity that can overpower her sense of ethics or morals, but she's not willing to let her fixation shape her life or choices. She does choose the health and well-being of her beloved friend after this event. She's willing to drop her hope for scientific advancement and completely scrap the experiments because of the consequences and price tag attached are too high. The experiments only continue with Ko's full consent and Hen setting the guidelines and parameters. It's a legitimate collaboration going forward instead of a vanity project or pet experiment. In regards to coding, the episode Dendi's Power establishes that Dendi embraces open source and all the philosophies that entails. She taught herself how to code through a mix of textbooks and the plentiful resources available through or shared by the open source community. She strongly emphasizes that everyone can learn this skill. There's no bar to entry. And honestly, she's the most excited talking about and sharing this interest above many of her others. Dendi holds some reluctance around heroics and continuously looks for her place in that world. Science is something that appeals to her curiosity and search for knowledge, but because it's her primary lens for understanding and navigating the world, she can become very individualistic and cagey. Science is a means for satisfying very personal, selfish ends. Coding was Dendi's introduction to what a truly welcoming and inclusive community could look like. It's what she ultimately wants from her life at large, but hasn't started applying to other areas of her life quite yet. So when others approach her about her POW card hack, she enthusiastically jumps in with what pointers, hints, or help she can provide. When Dendi helps Shannon and insists Shannon's misuse shouldn't be a bar towards a reflection of freely sharing information, it's absolutely commentary on the difference between corporate adoption and repackaging of code versus open source using forks but otherwise keeping everything adaptable or accessible to everyone. When a company like Windows keeps code strictly proprietary, users are at the mercy of corporate interests and what their hired help desk can do in spite of how tied their hands are. When code is freely accessible, anyone can alter or adapt it in what fits their use case, whatever that may be. The only restriction is how tech-savvy they are. Dendi presents coding as a superpower anyone can learn, and consistently uses her tech prowess and associated equipment more often than her actual superpowers. Superpowers are a fun part of the world and do play some role in shaping parts of characters, but Dendi is an active example of what more these characters are beyond their natural abilities or talents. Mr. Gar has a flaming elbow, but this is an accent to what fighting moves and grapples he learned as a luchador. Carol can mimic or recreate just about any power or ability someone else has, but she's more likely to use her fists, kicks, and martial arts than the extra practice or touch using someone else's trademark move needs. There's missed opportunity and other more direct parallels between Dendi and Professor Venomous, in my opinion. Where he's running away from his past or trying to destroy everything that frustrates him, Dendi wants to live in the present, confront what parts of the world frustrate her, and help build a society that's better for everybody. She's an interesting thematic foil. If Dendi lost her powers, it'd be a minor setback instead of a world-ending or identity-crushing event. Even if something happened to her tech, Dendi is resilient. She puts in the effort, work, and creativity to build systems and devices that work for her. Dendi's character is her journey to design who Dendi is in a way that feels satisfying and fulfilling to her. She wants to be an active participant in her world not just an outside observer. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy my videos and want to keep tabs on what I upload next, consider subscribing, ringing the bell, and more importantly, add me to your RSS reader. It's old, but it's a good way to avoid algorithm nonsense and see everything me or any of your other favorite creators put out there. Or well, keep better tabs on it. If you're in a spot where you can, consider donating to my Patreon to help keep the lights on as well as making videos like this one. I also recently shared some of my scraps, scripts, and content. Get a glimpse of what my cutting room floor looks like!